Dr. Andreas Ehrenfeld is one of the leading proponents of the low carbohydrate diet in Europe and certainly in Sweden, his home country, is probably the leading authority. And he's written this fabulous book which has recently been translated into English called The Low Carb High Fat Food Revolution in which he describes his own experiences of how he changed to this diet eight years ago and how he's promoted it in Sweden for the past eight years. In this lecture, he will also look at the question of obesity. Is it caused by hormonal imbalances or is it simply the fact that we're eating too much? Yeah, like was uh, mentioned, I'm really tall. <laughs> I'm uh, 202 centimeters, that's six foot seven. Now, I am tall because I ate too many calories. <laughs> it's true. I forgot to count my calories and that's why I'm tall. I don't know if you've noticed, but tall people, they, are, they just eat way too much food. <laughs> of course, there's another theory going around that uh, height is controlled by how much, much growth hormone there is uh, in a teenager's uh, body. That makes them grow and then they get hungry and eat to, to keep up. But if you ask any expert on nutrition today, they're likely to tell you that hormones can be ignored. What regulates growth can be ignored. Only thing that matters for growth is excess calories. So is that true? Let's change topic from height to weight, from vertical growth to horizontal growth. Move up to topic of this lecture. What is the smartest way if you want to lose weight? Should you uh, focus on uh, calories or should you focus on hormones, like the fat storing hormone insulin? This question can actually be rephrased to make it a lot more interesting. Is weight control a question of bad food or bad character? You know, the junk food industry always tells us that uh, it doesn't matter what you eat. It only matters how many calories you eat. Because, yeah, there is no bad food, especially not their food, right? Uh, there is only bad character. Is that true, or is there a better, more useful truth? I'm going to talk about that this lecture, but first a couple of words about David. And, and David, he's of course the famous statue by Michelangelo, grew up in, uh, in Italy. And in 1984, in March of 1984, David moved to the United States. And uh, he was taught two essential facts of nutrition, like all Americans. Number one, to avoid fat, of course. And number two, to count his calories. So, yeah, he did. And uh, <laughs> that didn't <laughs> end up so well for poor David. <laughs> like lots of people, like millions of people in the last 30 years. Uh, so, the question is, why, why is this uh, happening? And, and what can we do about it? Let's start by getting some perspective. This is a, like a basic view of human evolution. And my only point is that it, it, it took millions of years, right? It takes a long time to change our bodies, to change our genes. But the modern obesity epidemic, yeah, that didn't take millions of years actually happened in 31 years. And I mean, how is that even possible? It's hard to believe, right? But have a quick look. Here's obesity statistics from the United States, 1985. And you can see in the blue states where we have data, they, they have about uh, a 10% um, rate of obesity, meaning, you know, BMI over 30, meaning 40 pounds of overweight. Or more. Let's move ahead quickly two years at a time. 87, 89, 91, 93, and 95. You can see something is happening rapidly, and these new dark blue states are now covering half the nation. That's over 15% obesity. So a huge increase in just a decade. Let's move on. 97, 99, 01, 03, 05, 07. 2009, 2011, and 2013. And this is, this is crazy. The, the yellow states are over 20% obesity. That's double in the 80s. 
orange over 25, red over 30, dark red over 35%. So obesity has become something normal in America. And uh, kids are affected too. You all know this. Since the 80s, obesity rates have tripled. And, and the point is, I guess, that obviously this is not a sudden genetic problem because everybody doesn't mutate at the same time in the same way. This is something in the environment. And the only question is, what? The most common explanation today is that people simply ate more calories than they burned. So, yeah, suddenly the entire world de developed bad character at exactly the same time. Everybody became lazy, kind of stupid, gluttons. I think a Homer Simpson virus must have spread across the world, some sort of you know, genetically engineered thing. Anyway, this explanation about calories, this is what the junk food industry desperately wants you to believe. It's what they spend billions of dollars trying to convince you of, because this means that they are automatically innocent. So, for example, the biggest uh, association of nutrition professionals in, in the US, A&D, <coughs> for dietitians and, and other professions like that, are sponsored by the Coca-Cola company and also PepsiCo, making it possible for them to provide uh, you know, education to dietitians, for example, like this seminar on coaching your clients towards lasting weight loss, sponsored by, of course, Coca-Cola. Yeah, and here's an example from, um, from Canada. The Ontario Healthy Kid Strategy, where they, among other things, try to uh, reduce childhood obesity. And the conference is sponsored by Coca-Cola. So, has this sort of thinking helped us that it's all about bad character? Because we've been saying it for decades. Hardly, right? Extreme obesity is exploding in America and across the world. Uh, People get, keep getting more and more obese, and we obviously have to stop this in some way. And just blaming the victims is not only the wrong thing to do, it's not a solution. It's not helpful. So we need a deeper understanding of the underlying problem. So what really happened 31 years ago? Well, a lot of you know that a large campaign was launched to teach the American people to, to fear fat you know, by the government. And eggs and bacon became really dangerous because, yeah, you know, they elevate cholesterol in the blood and that allegedly gave us heart disease. And we heard a lot about it in the, in the media in the last few years and, and around here that this was based on nothing more than theory. There were never any proof of it. And now we know that it was a mistake because this does not stop us from getting heart disease. It's useless advice, but it's actually worse because if you eat a lot less fat, of course you need to eat something else unless you want to be hungry. And the uh, practical reality is that if you eat less fat, you're going to eat more carbs because protein is a smaller piece of normal food. So, and unfortunately, we didn't just replace the fat with vegetables and, you know, some rice and potatoes. No, we replaced it with a lot of bad carbs like this. You know, stuff that's, once it gets into the stomach, it's instantly broken down to simple sugars, and it goes out into the bloodstream, and it raises your blood glucose, blood sugar. This raises the hormone insulin, which of course tells the body to burn the carbs, and that's, that's fine, but it's, it does one more thing. It tells the body to store fat until later. Know, burn carbs now, store fat until later. Also fine if it only happens once in a while. But what if we get the advice to eat high-carb food every two or three hours, like we've been told, right? Then we're constantly telling the body to store fat, and this could lead to obesity. Let's examine this, this insulin connection in more detail. What is the typical difference? between an obese and a thin person. How can we explain this, this common you know, obesity that's all around us? 
I work as a family doctor. I, I spent a decade treating obese people and reading and thinking about this, but for a long time it was confusing to me, but it's absolutely possible to make sense of it. And you may know this, that people with obesity normally have high levels of insulin, abnormally high levels of insulin, the fat storing hormone, while thin people have usually lower levels. And I mean, this has been shown in a number of studies. It's not really controversial at all. And when I test obese patients in my clinic, their insulin levels are usually really high. Just one example from, from one study of fasting insulin levels, that's the vertical axis in different groups. And we have uh, the column, the green column on the left. That's normal, healthy weight people, you know, the way we all used to be. We have relatively low le levels of fasting insulin. The red column is healthy people that are obese. And you can see it's quite a lot higher. So what's the rest? Next one, the next red one, that, that's the people with obesity who also have slightly elevated blood sugar levels. So they're heading towards type 2 diabetes. Next one, even worse, they passed the border to type 2 diabetes. They have obesity and type 2. The last one, yeah, they have obesity, type 2 diabetes, and they have really high blood sugar levels. And you can see the difference is huge, right, in the fasting insulin levels. So we're not talking about, you know, slightly elevated, you know, 10 percent, 15 percent. We're talking about 500 percent, 1,000 percent. Now, you know, imagine what would happen if any important regulatory hormone in the body, like thyroid, cortisol, whatever, you know, gets 10 times normal. It messes things up. It leads to disease, right? And insulin is a fat-storing hormone. So it gets even uh, more interesting, because if your insulin increases, yeah, you're probably going to gain weight too. And the obvious example is the one we just mentioned, type 2 diabetes, they usually have high levels of insulin and they usually gain weight and become more and more obese as the disease progresses. On the other hand, we have sort of the opposite. What is the opposite of type 2 diabetes? Well, you can lower insulin and it leads to weight loss. For example, type 1 diabetes, which is in a way the opposite. Instead of high levels of insulin, the body actually loses its ability to manufacture insulin. So the levels get really low. And what happens to people when they get this disease? Their weight plummets, right? So here's a sad picture from the early 19th century. You know, young people who got type 1 diabetes, they, they often, usually, I mean, all of them basically, starved to death. They just couldn't keep the weight on. And, uh, but not, not this kid. He could have died, but he was one of the first to be treated with this new artificial insulin injections. And his weight returned, and his life was saved. <laughs> You'd think he could be just a little bit grateful and smile for the camera. <laughs> Anyway, so loss of insulin, loss of weight, and insulin injections mean weight gain. Here's something interesting. Higher doses also means higher, more, more weight gain. What is this? You know, it looks like a guy who decided to get silicone implants in like the wrong place, but of course it's, it's not. It's fat deposits, and you may have guessed why. This is a type 1 diabetic. And for decades, he injected himself with insulin, either to the right or to the left of his belly button. And this is the local effect of high insulin doses, fat accumulation. So injecting it leads to fat accumulation. What happens with the opposite? Yeah, well, uh, you know about type 1, but it's also, there's also people who who sort of got their type 1 diabetes under control, and then they decide to stop using insulin. Why? Well, this is usually young people, perhaps mostly girls, who get an eating disorder. They want to lose weight. 
So, when they, they figure out how to do it, they stop taking their insulin. And it's a total disaster for their health, really wrecks the body, but they know that they will lose weight doing this. It's actually not an uncommon problem, fortunately. Something completely different going up again. Something that raises the insulin level, levels in a completely unique way. <clears throat> Insulinoma, that's a rare tumor that produces insulin. What happens if you get that? Well, it's common that people get hungry, really hungry, want to eat all the time, and they gain weight. You know, a, a colleague, uh, an, an uh, endocrinologist, told me a story. This is a rare disease, but she had remembered one particular patient. This was an, an elderly lady, and she got this, this tumor that produced insulin. And she was really old, so she didn't really want surgery, didn't want to take the tumor out. She decided not to do it. So this, this tumor just grew and grew, and she became you know, hungry. She, she had to eventually set her alarm clock every two hours during the night to get up and eat. And she, she became massively obese. Sad, but interesting. What happens if you block the body's normal production of insulin? There's a, a drug called octreotide that kind of lessens the insulin production a bit. And, and for some obese patients, this can actually be a good treatment, even though it's not, it's not something for everybody because it's had, it has, has side effects. Let's leave all the diseases, all the drugs, and move into more you know, uh, common ter territory where we sort of live our lives and try to help our patients. The easiest way by far to raise your insulin and the tastiest way is, is high carb junk food like this. And it's, it's hardly controversial to say that this is the number one problem when it comes to weight control in society today. And, and it's hardly a coincidence that this is the most effective way to raise your insulin levels. High carb junk food raises insulin, raises weight, and the opposite is low carb diets do the exact opposite. Of course, you get rid of the large sources of starch and sugar, uh, carbs, and you eat all you like of low carb food. You can call it LCHF, you can call it Banting, you can call it Atkins, whatever works the same way just works. It's the simplest way to drastically reduce the insulin levels, and they're often very effective for weight loss. You've seen these tables before during this conference. If you do fair comparisons between low-carb and low-fat diets, RCTs, you can find example after example where low-carb gives you a, a bigger weight loss in the, in the group that get the low-carb advice compared to low-fat. It, it's not even close. You can have a look at these studies on my free website, if you like, at dietdoctor.com. Actually, if you debate this online, some, some people online actually claim that, no, low-carb diets do not lower insulin because protein kind of raises it a bit and yada, yada. <laughs> yeah, but that is actually a sort of silly argument because you're, you're trading carbs for fat, and carbs raise insulin, fat do not. And it's been shown in a number of studies that the effect is dramatic. This is just one example I'm going to show you. Two groups, and this is insulin levels all over the day from 8 a.m. one uh, morning to 8 a.m. the next morning. The black line is a group who had a normal sort of high-carb diet. The red group had a low-carb diet, and you can see the difference in insulin levels all across the, the day is, is really big. And this, there, there are a number of studies like this. So it's no question about it. Low-carb lowers both weight and insulin. Going back to the other side, again, how can you make high-carb junk food even worse? Well, you do what the experts tell you to do, and you eat every two or three hours, even if you're not hungry. You know, this could be, to me at least, the single most bizarre advice today ever <laughs> to eat more food even if you don't want to eat it to lose weight to me that's really strange 
what you're really doing is, is making sure that the insulin is always elevated and you're always storing fat. The opposite, not eating for a while, like intermittent fasting, maybe not eating for uh, 16 hours or something like that, is a popular way of losing weight. And of course, you know, fasting is a low-carb diet, right? <laughs> Finally, exercise. Sedentary living means that you burn less carbs, and this means that your insulin shoots up more when you eat carbs, and sedentary living is also connected to weight gain. While exercise means you burn more carbs, insulin keeps more under control when you eat it, and it's connected to some weight loss, although, as many know, exercise is not really very effective for weight loss, but it can, can help a little bit. So, Whichever way you look at this, more insulin, more weight gain, and vice versa. And still, <laughs> some people are not at all convinced by this, right? They have objections. So I'm going to finish up by talking about the five main objections to this. Starting, of course, with calories, because you know that all this might sound nice, but it's all calories anyway, right? So, <clears throat> problem is that if you, if you look at it like this, it looks very, very simple, right? Positive caloric balance leads to obesity. They got high insulin, that's a side effect, sort of. And a negative caloric balance leads to weight loss. Very simple, but it's an oversimplification. And the Massive problem is that this ignores the causes. Causes like the ones we just discussed, right? Let me explain. It's still, it, this took me some time to really get my head around, but let me explain it, uh, make it clearer with another example. Constipation. Has anybody in here ever been constipated? <laughs> like a few people at least, brave people. Um, so you know probably that uh, there are lots of possible causes of constipation, right? Like uh, dehydration, lack of fiber, iron supplements, very common. If you want to avoid getting constipated or if you want to treat constipation, you would be very wise to correct these causes, right? But a calorie counter, would tell you that none of this matters at all. He would tell you that, <laughs> that uh, the only cause of constipation is a positive fecal balance. <laughs> it's, it's true. So, uh, no joke. If you had constipation, a calorie counter would tell you that you need to eat less and defecate more. We tell you to stop your whining and excuses and just do it. <laughs> and it's, yeah, you're laughing, and you should, right? It's a smart-ass comment. It's silly. Same thing with calories. If we ignore the cause, we can't fix it. That's why this is an oversimplification. We need to know the cause to be able to fix it. In fact, if we say that obesity is caused by a positive caloric balance, and a positive caloric balance is virtually the same thing as gaining weight, what we're really saying here is that obesity is caused by weight gain, <laughs> which is, strictly speaking, true but it's not really helpful because it ignores the causes, because it's an oversimplification that doesn't help us. So we need to get beyond this oversimplification. Next objection is that only the hormone leptin matters. Insulin doesn't matter, only leptin. And you know leptin, it's the hormone that comes from our fat cells, goes up to the brain and tells us when when the fat stores are full and we can stop eating. Problem is that a high insulin level blocks this signal and makes us think 
that we're starving even when we're not. We're talking about a chronically elevated insulin level. Not necessarily short peak, but if it's always high, like it is for obese people, then it has this effect. And that's how a high insulin level can override leptin. And that's why if your insulin is sky high, your leptin will not save you. And we can have a long uh, lecture about exactly how this happens in the brain. I'm not really that interested in that. I'm not a cell biologist. I'm a, just a family doctor, you know, trying to help my patients. So what I'm interested in is what works and, and you know, the simplest way to make this clear. I would only say that the same thing is true for any important hormone. We know that. Like cortisol, your stress hormone, if it's really high, you're likely to gain weight. We know that. Leptin won't save you. And if your thyroid hormone is really low, you'll probably put on some weight. Leptin will not save you. Same thing with insulin, right? All the important hormones have to be in the normal range to make it easy to, uh, to maintain a normal, normal weight. And definitely including insulin, which is the main fat storing hormone. So leptin is important, sure, absolutely, but it's not everything. All important hormones must work. Next objection, third one, is that only food reward matters. And you might know this by another name, the toxic environment, right? The obesogenic environment. This uh, theory says that some food is so rewarding, so palatable, that we just can't stop ourselves. We eat too much of it. And interestingly, this high reward food is often <laughs> the same high carb junk food that we already knew was a problem. And, and this could be easily uh, the topic for an entire lecture, but I'm just going to cut to the, straight to the bottom line here. We're talking about the addictive properties of food and food addiction, which is an absolutely a, a real problem. Because fast food, sweets, sugar is rewarding. It can be addictive, like other highly rewarding things. And uh, indeed, food manufacturers, they go out of their way. They do, they do everything they can to make their products as, as rewarding, as addictive as possible, because then they sell more, right? And uh, if you want to read a book on this subject, I can recommend this one called Sugar Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us. So what happens if, if you get addicted or if you, one of your patients get addicted to high-carb junk food? Well that person is going to eat it constantly. Insulin is going to shoot through the roof, and the person will gain weight. And that's why there's really no reason to choose, you know, one or the other here, because these theories work beautifully together. Food reward and the toxic environment is uh, an important piece of the puzzle, especially when it comes to all kinds of food addictions, but it's not it's not everything. It's not all that matters. Number two is a very odd objection. Um, but insulin should predict weight gain. Who cares about that? If you debate this online at any length, you're liable to, to run into someone who says that, no, 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 this theory is wrong because uh, people with high insulin levels don't necessarily gain more weight or vice versa. This can't be right. If this was right, then people with a high insulin level would gain more weight than other people. And they, they don't necessarily do that in studies. So it would appear to be a problem, but it's not. Have a look. People with high insulin levels are usually already overweight or obese. People with low levels are usually already thin. They might be weight stable, though, right? You could be the same level of obesity for a long time. It's not uncommon at all. You know, um, the levels can't predict future weight gain. It's impossible, because here's what would happen if they did. If people with high insulin levels would gain more weight in the coming year than other people, well, this is what would happen. They would keep gaining, gaining quicker and quicker until they exploded. And that doesn't happen, right? 
what would happen to the people with low insulin levels? They would lose more weight than other people, right? And the thinner they get, the more they will lose. So they would disappear. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't happen. No. So high insulin, it predicts being, already being obese. Low insulin predicts already being thin. If you want to predict a change in weight, you have to look at a change in insulin levels. And if you look at a change, yeah, it works perfectly that way too. So at least to me, this makes perfect sense. I would say that this objection is based on a misunderstanding. It's not really relevant. But finally, the number one objection to this insulin theory. What can it be? What about the thin Asians, right? <laughs> like Chinese, traditional Chinese, traditional Japanese people, they ate lots of rice and they did not have obesity. And the same thing is true for lots of populations around the world eating, you know, being poor and eating unrefined carbohydrates, starchy carbs without problem. So it's clear that everybody do not have to avoid all carbohydrates. Avoiding the worst carbs, the stuff that these people didn't have, like refined sugar and flour, can often be enough. And there is some discussion about safe carbs, which is interesting on a low-carb conference. <laughs> Might get stoned here. So, um, safe carbs like, you know, potatoes perhaps, a little bit of rice, no gluten there, no fructose. So for, the question is, can you tolerate some safe starches? Slow carbs, you know, good carbs, unrefined, uh, fiber-rich carbs. Well, if you look like this guy, or a female version of him, the answer is likely yes. Most likely. It's not necessary for everybody to be on a strict low-carb diet, which is good for the environment, perhaps, you know. And there is more bacon for the rest of us. <laughs> everybody don't need it. <laughs> and, and if you're thin and metabolically healthy, you can probably have all the fruit you like, I think. But most people in the Western world, they don't really look like this guy anymore. Many people look more like this. Yeah. And, uh, they have weight issues. They have uh, maybe high blood pressure too, maybe borderline diabetes, metabolic syndrome, you know it. And then very few carbs are safe and they're probably better off on a strict low carb diet. So uh, sensitivity from, to carbs, it varies from person to person. But there is one thing that's a disaster for everybody here. And that's to do what a lot of people in the Western world are doing today. Eating the stuff that's available. High carb junk food everywhere. Eating all the time, because they're even told to do that. And leading more or less sedentary lives. This will sooner or later result in high insulin levels and weight gain. And in an obesogenic environment, the junk food is rarely far, far away, you know, 200 meters, that, that's a lot, right? It's often within an arm's reach, you know, very close. And, and trying to eat just a little bit, just one bite, a balanced sort of donut diet, <laughs> is it, really hard because it's highly rewarding, it's addictive, it's hard to stop, it's almost doomed to eventually fail. Willpower is not enough because it's a finite resource. And uh, lack of willpower is not really the problem. We need a better solution, better strategy. Like uh, getting rid of the junk food from our lives, cleaning it away from our homes, eating some form of low-carb diet, at least you know, lower carb or slower carb than most people. Perhaps even adding some intermittent fasting if you'd like perhaps exercising. And you probably know this already. And that's why you could help to stop this disaster. We can spread this knowledge and we can break this epidemic. To do that, we need to get more people to understand this, the fundamental importance of this fat storing hormone, insulin. So is it about bad food? 
or bad character? Well, maybe it's the wrong question, because maybe it's both. Like this. If you eat a lot of bad food, your insulin will be eventually too high, and you'll be too hungry. In a way, this will result in bad character, the appearance of bad character. On the other hand, if you eat good food, real food, without too many bad carbs, your insulin will hopefully stay in the normal range, and you'll hopefully not be too hungry. Now, in a way, you will get good character. Fantastic. And this way, there's no need to count the calories. It would take care of itself. And, and people would eat when they're hungry. They'd want to eat the right amount of calories. And eating would be a natural thing again, like breathing. To get there, we need to get more people to understand this, the fundamental role of the hormone insulin, because less bad food means less insulin, less fat storage. And this would never have to happen to another child. The obesity epidemic would be no more. Thank you.